Oh, bother. What I wouldn't give for just a little smackerel of podcast. Hello there, and welcome to Magic by Design. We are going back to the Hundred Acre Wood this week as we review Disney's 51st animated feature, Winnie the Pooh, first released in 2011. My name is Ken, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host slash brother Garrett. Gar, how are you? We're back to Pooh! Yeah, only 29 episodes later. You counted? Yes. Good job, Ken. If we repeat any of our takes in that episode, I, I meant to listen to it just so I don't say the same thing over and over again, but um, I didn't. So <laughs> if we repeat the same things over and over again that we said in the last Pooh episode, just pretend that they're new witty jokes or insightful insights as yeah. opposed to the non-insightful insights. Uh, yeah, it's, and, it's, and just put up with us. We're fine. It's worth mentioning that this film is almost identical to the 1977 one. Well, no, it's not. Well, the, the it's, fo- it's almost identical. That would be like saying Frozen 2 is almost identical to Frozen just because it's set in Arendelle and has the same characters it's not it has a very particular format that they follow here yeah it's a it's a it's not a sequel per se I suppose it is a sequel really Uh, like there's nothing that's it it doesn't undermine the Pooh canon that's established in the first one but Pooh is kind of in a weird place because it's in a moment in time that's almost frozen so all the events happen let me finish my point please it's almost like god let it go would you Are you quite done? (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, what are we, like a minute in and Ken already wants to strangle me? Welcome to Magic by Design. It's almost like all the Pooh events happen at the same time, but also in a linear fashion. So like they're... So are you saying Pooh is like The Simpsons? Yeah. Or each episode of The Simpsons is just completely, totally unrelated to prior episodes of The Simpsons, except the ones that aren't. And each instance of Pooh only exists in that instance and never has bearing on either future Pooh or past Pooh. Correct. Who is the original (laughs) Simpsons is what I'm saying here. I saw an episode of The Simpsons the other day and Bart was like, I'm nearly 11 years old. He's like, wow, a lot has happened in this one year for The Simpsons. Yeah. Well, no, they, like that's the thing about The Simpsons. Each episode of The Simpsons, there was controversy about this recently. When they did something that somewhat, I can't even remember what the controversy was, but they undermined Simpsons canon somehow. And they were like, that the version of The Simpsons that existed in that episode that we contradicted still exists because every episode of The Simpsons is just a one-off individual story as opposed to a continuous narrative arc. In the, in the most recent episode of The Simpsons, the monorail was never built. But then you get like, Maud Flanders is dead, you know? And they've had like several versions of how Marge and Homer met. There was one episode where they were in the 90s grunge scene, even though they grew up in the 70s. So like, if you're trying to make sense or stitch this together, it's not going to happen. Yeah, because so like, surely like there's the episode in which Maud Flanders dies. And surely she should then be alive for all other episodes because prior episodes don't have bearing on future episodes, except the death of a character. So it's basically what I'm saying is The Simpsons makes it up as they go and there is no canon and i guess the same is is true of Pooh. Pooh just makes it up as he goes he's like honey this film gar you touched on it there is a revival of the winnie the pooh franchise it's the fifth theatrical adaptation released now like this film a lot of them are quite short yeah we'll go straight into the the big talking point about this film the big critique of the film can is that this film like start to finish is 55 minutes long i think we were into the credits by the time we noticed the time so i think it's possibly even less and I'm fine with that. For a poo for them, it makes sense. Like, like, people equate length with, like, value for money. Which, to an extent, I understand. Like, if you go to see a film and whatever the ticket costs for these days, 8 to 10 euro, depending where you go and when you go, uh, you do want to get value for money. And people do generally say, if the film is too short, you didn't get value for money. Whereas I think that's utter nonsense. I don't think that's how you should ever value any piece of culture or media. Like, if I buy a video game... Most video games are too long. Video games, uh, people are like, oh, I want my game to be 100 hours long. Give me hours and hours of entertainment. I'm like, nah. Make most games like four to six hours long and just give me like good bursts of interesting things to do. And this poo film, you see, the, the, the way every critic should approach this is not, did this give me, a, like time-wise, did this give me a return on the money I put in? The question critics should ask is, would this film be any better if it were longer? What's your answer to that question, Ken? Well, Gar, there was an idea initially to include five Pooh stories. Mm. They went with three in the end. And I think as much as I would have maybe liked to see more, 
it possibly would have outstayed its welcome at an hour and a half plus. I'm very much of the opinion that if this film was, as you mentioned, two stories longer, which would have added at least like another half hour to the runtime, which it brought up to like one one twenty five, one thirty. I w- I think it would it would have outstayed it because right on the point at it ended, it's like I've had my fill of poo. They've told them I've had my fill of poo. <laughs> They've told their story. You're always full of poo. <laughs> I am full of poo. That's very true. <laughs> God damn it, Pooh, and your punny name. But but I would have thought this film would have outstayed its welcome. It was the length it should have been. And more importantly, it was the length it needed to be to tell its story, to be utterly charming and entirely delightful, and then end without outstaying its welcome, without retreading the ground it had already tread, without having to come up with another contrived way. Because I, I actually, what I really like about this film is it is three different stories, but they are seamlessly blended. Like, yeah. like th- they run one into the next, into the next, and then they tie them all together at the end. Because, like, the reoccurring through line is Pooh wants honey, which... You know, he always, always does. and Eeyore needs his tail, and th- like that's what connects these three stories. And they they tie them together, and they tie them in a little knot at the end with a tail being put on Eeyore, back on Eeyore. And this film wouldn't have been any better if it was longer. That's my point. I d- I hate criticism that's like it should have been. Uh, you know, th- th- it wasn't value for money. It was. This film is the delight. I saw this in the cinema, and I was like, this film is a delight. <laughs> This was my first time seeing it, and maybe I am still a bit old school in the sense that that I judge films by length. Ah, look at you, mister. It's not two hours long. Well, I'm just thinking if you're taking the kids and you want to distract them for a couple hours, you know, it does feel quite short. They did package this with a short as well. Which I don't remember at all. (laughs) It's about six minutes long. It's it's about Nessie. So I I think, you know, you would have been in the cinema about an hour and a half by the time things wrapped up. And it has a very nice closing sequence as well, which is worth watching. Oh oh god, the credits are so good. Yeah, this film has like the best credits. They're all like fully animated and poo characters pop in and out and there's little tiebacks and throwbacks to the film and then there's the bit before the actual credits roll, the little pre-credits credits. credits. It's like this live action scene, which we'll talk about because it opens the film as well, but this live action room with all the Winnie the Pooh characters. Much like the original God, it's a delight. This film is just a delight. It is one hour. You will sit down. You will find it utterly charming. You'll find it delightful. It will tickle you in ways you did not know you needed to be tickled. It is full of delightful wordplay and like witty one-liners and wonderful animation. God, I loved it. Like, like for instance, the frog was like, oh, look at the 2D animation the way Disney used to do it in the 90s. This is more like 2D animation the way Disney used to do it in the 50s. And I love it so much. It's so nice. It has that really nice moving storybook feel and the painterly style which we love this film is perfect like the people are like oh it's not long enough it's like judge it in what it is which is perfect. <laughs> in 2009, John Lasseter, directors Anderson and Hall, viewed the classic Winnie the Pooh feature shorts and films to figure out how to make the title character culturally relevant to a modern audience. And what The answer is to just go back and do what you did. In exactly. what, what was the, when did the first one come out? 50s? Yeah, just do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't change it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The original title of the movie was Winnie the Pooh and the Day in Which Many Things Happened. But in 2010, uh, this was confirmed to change to just Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. White Muddy the Waters. It's Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. That's all you need to know. Going by 2000 standards, it would have been just poo. Yeah. And that's problematic. And But even then, it would have been a, a, like a deep, gritty revival. It's like poo. He's just yeah. going by his one name now. And it'd like be a post-apocalyptic film where he's scrounging through the desert landscape for honey. And it's like, oh, bother, I'm a bear, very little brain. And the world has ended. And there is no honey. All the honeybees are dead. So there is no honey. Oh, bother. He comes across Christopher Robin, who is a freedom fighter in the war. He has a bionic arm. Yeah, and like like when they they get cornered by a bunch of wasteland scroungers who are trying to pillage them for all the food they're worth, suddenly Eeyore rocks up and he kicks a bunch of ass. And he's like, the world is even more depressing than I could imagine. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and he just kills himself. <laughs> and Rabbit is hoarding things down under like some hole somewhere and he's neurotically doesn't let anybody in and he doesn't trust anybody. And Owl is definitely the villain. And Owl is Owl is the one that has thrived in this post-apocalyptic landscape who is just like running the economy of the, the end of the world and then Piglet what's Piglet doing in a post-apocalyptic No, Piglet's dead. Piglet's yeah, the one that died. He's been dead years. <laughs> yeah. Piglet's the one that's just like, oh no, he's the first to go. That's this is the gritty Winnie the Pooh reboot we need. I watched Love and Monsters during the week, which is a post-apocalyptic film on Netflix. So that's clearly where my headspace is. Yeah, you're mixing the two genres. Yeah, Dylan O'Brien would be in it for some reason. Production on this film began in September 2008, and Lasseter said that Disney wanted to create a film Sorry. that... I'm just picturing, like, uh, the group of, like, Pooh and Eeyore just stumbling across Piglet's grave in the middle of a desert wasteland. And, like, the solemn melancholy moment of Pooh realising his friend is dead. And he hasn't quite come to terms with it until that moment. Oh, 
Sorry. <laughs> anyway, Lester wanted a film that would transcend generations. He was on a serious nostalgia kick these days. He's really, as we said in Princess and the Frog, they're going back for that 50s and 60s style that he would have grown up with. Transcending generations, not so much, maybe. Like, that's a bit of... Corporate nonsense. Yeah, but... Like, but this film is timeless. This yeah. film, this, the film this is like one of those films that parents will love it and kids will love it. And that's what makes film, even though they didn't because this film flopped. But <laughs> yeah. clearly... I mean, the visuals are very crisp and clean. Mm. Like th- th- this film won't age in the same way dinosaur aged. Yeah, you know, we watched dinosaur and we're like, ugh. Like people will watch this film in seventy years and go, oh, geez, that animation really held up. Because in in that regard, in the same way we'd watch like Sleeping Beauty and go, like, oh, you know, that animation really holds up because it's simple and sticks to the basic principles that founded animation. Winnie the Pooh was released in April 2011 in Europe and July 2011 in the United States. The film received largely positive reviews from critics who praised the acting, script, animation, humour and soundtrack, not to mention the fidelity to Milne's original stories. Yeah, you do get that offbeat humour in there. Yeah. However, it was commercially unsuccessful, grossing only 50 million on a budget of 30 million. Likely the reason we haven't seen a 2D feature since, but it did feature stiff competition from the final Harry Potter film. God damn it. People went to see Potter over Pooh. What a terrible choice. Also, like, non... Like, staggered releases is such a weird thing. Like, it does still happen sometimes. But, like, it was so much more common back in, like, the, even a decade ago that, like, Pixar films wouldn't come out here for, like, four months after they came out in America. And sometimes we get it first, weirdly. Yeah, and it's, like, w- such a weird phenomenon when you think about it. It's like, why are you... What are you doing? Didn't that happen with Endgame? Well, uh, no, it was, like, a week or so, yeah. though. Like, th- th- those are... Fu- you know, they're in the same window. Or as like I think Toy Story 4 came out like three months later. And it used to be the case like video games wouldn't like Japanese video games wouldn't come out in the West for a year. That's usually because like they'd make the Japanese version of them first, and then after that was released, they'd move on to localizing it for Western audiences. Which I, I assume to happens with these films as well, obviously. Like Winnie the Pooh is dubbed when it's released in Spain or China. So like I, I, to an extent I get a staggered release there, but in like English speaking countries, it's like you have one version of the film. What are you waiting for? Yeah, I get it. Especially with a globalized world these days on the internet, you know, where you're risking spoilers instantly. And like, I suppose it probably comes from like, there used to be a world where like Disney was somewhat autonomous in Europe and separate from America, you know, like there'd be the Disney European branch and the Disney American branch and they'd release it when they thought it was best to be released in Europe. Whereas now it's just Disney, this global conglomerate that acts as like this single unified force. Like I get there's times when people are free to go to see films more Mm -hmm. like Christmas and summer. There is that sensation that the reason the summer blockbuster exists that people go into movie theaters to escape the heat. Yes. That's what they... And all the kids are out of school. Yeah. But I think if there's enough buzz for a film, people go see it any time, really, these days. Yeah, and I suppose that the difference, like, European holidays are different from American holidays. You might want to target, like, a UK bank holiday weekend for the UK release, or America, you'd want to do Thanksgiving, which isn't a thing over here. So there, there is those kind of things that would cause you to release films at different times. I still find it a very strange phenomenon to be like, you know, two months later, America got it after Europe got it. It's weird. Following a trip to Ashdown Forest in Sussex. Did they really need to do research for this film? <laughs> to get the authenticity of the forest down. <laughs> yeah. Ashton- we have to go to England. Sorry, guys. Give us a free trip to England. Yeah, we, we got... I mean, everyone else got a free holiday, so... <laughs> Ashdown Forest, as you may know, is in southeast England and is the inspiration for the forest in Milne's stories. The filmmakers also enlisted Bernie Mattinson, who was a Disney veteran that worked on the 1974 short Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 to serve as lead storyboard artist for the film. I think that's a smart move because they're preserving the iconic look of the characters and the style while updating it for a modern audience because basically the only difference is that it's a bit more fluid and graphical because it's made in a computer but the look is very similar to the 70s film. Yeah and it keeps like the institutional knowledge there and it makes sure it's consistent with what it used to be even if it's 40 years on from that person's version of Pooh. I thought you were going to say it's someone who worked on the original film and it's like what would he have been like 80? Well I'm not sure when Pooh originated. I don't think it was maybe as far back as the 50s but maybe late 50s or 60s. You can Google there Gar. There had been in some talk of using CGI for this film, director Anderson stated that if this were a fully CG anime 
animated film and rendered Pooh, it just wouldn't feel right. We wouldn't be doing the characters justice. Oh yeah, Many Adventures of Pooh was 77, so that's yeah. actually quite recent. No, yeah. well, that's not. It's still 35 years before the release of this film, but still. Anderson said it. I think it would have done a real disservice to make this a 3D film. Have you seen any of the 3D Pooh? Yeah, it doesn't look It's right. not nice. I don't like it at all. I like really detest it on a level that I could not possibly detest things more. And actually, they, they made the Christopher Robin film. Was that the... Yeah, Christopher Robin's the Disney one, right? Yeah. As opposed to the documentary. Which Goodbye, is, Christopher uh, Robin. Is the documentary. No, no, that's the biopic, not a documentary. Yeah. Different things. But like the choice they made in Christopher Robin, instead of making them 3D versions of the 2D characters, they made them like 3D versions of like the teddy bears, yeah. which was so much a smarter choice in terms of like rendering those characters in 3D than just taking this poo. I have, we have Pumpkin Poo back, by the way. That's a callback to the original Poo episode. He's much less out of season than he was. Uh, he, it was like September, I think we did the Poo episode. So I think he was relatively in season when we did Winnie the Pooh last time. So now it's April and he's not very in season at all. But Pumpkin Poo is here. But if you took this Poo and turned him into 3D, it would look gross. And it does look gross if you look if you watch any of the uh, the, the children's cartoons that yeah. are like the uh, you, me, and Poo, whatever they're called. Uh, there's so many different Poos out there. <laughs> there's Poo everywhere. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it looks gross. That's the moral of the story. I hate it. If you take like the Garfield movie or the or even the Sonic film recently, I don't think it looks that bad, but it it does just jar with the environment. It's clearly a cartoon on top of live action whereas in we'll talk about the Christopher Robin film later I'm sure in the legacy but it just blends more because it has the look of a, a weathered plate thing yeah. rather than just 3D and like the shape of poo like oh, it's, it'll look really weird and like Rugrats is getting a 3D reboot and just seeing those characters in 3D they're just gross it's like ugh <laughs> and, and the thing is like even if they textured it somehow but it's that really almost old school early 90s looking 3D yeah where they're really round and just monotone it just looks terrible it's, yeah especially because like Rugrats was never I wouldn't say like Rugrats was the pinnacle of animation it looked great but it had this distinct look to it that's what I'm saying and part of the appeal was that it had a bit of a janky yeah hand drawn style you know and, and Pooh has this clean storybook that goes back to the original character animations and it's great many of the animations staff from Princess and the Frog were brought in to work on this film. The reason being because the production used the same software utilized for Princess and the Frog, and Toon Boom Animations Harmony. 2D. Yeah. The last 2D film as well, by yeah. the way. This is the death of 2D. <laughs> like, maybe this is, like, like they've released this 2D film, this 2D poo film that would flopped. Like, it, it didn't lose money, but it certainly didn't make money. Yeah. So, maybe broke they're even, like, Just about broke even, I'd say. And when you look at the success of Tangled, which was a big hit, versus Princess and the Frog, which again was a modest hit, maybe they are like, well, Princess and the Frog didn't set the world on fire, poo didn't make money and these 3d films are making money so maybe it is like truly the point at which the disney sat down and said 2d animation at disney is now really well and truly dead but as a piece of art in its own right i think the way they're able to mimic they're inking and painting digitally yeah. but they're able to mimic the hand-painted storybook style and if you're watching the two films side by side you notice that you know the colors are a bit more vibrant you notice that's a bit more fluid but you could watch those two films and if they stitched them together you wouldn't notice much of a difference and that's a big achievement well the aspect ratio is probably different but actually yeah. no 70s probably not yeah um but yeah it, it's a very pretty film and it's very pretty in, like in a way that's not similar to princess and the frog i said princess and the frog is very much we're doing 2d again whereas this is just like it's just effortless it really does feel effortless that they've thrown back to this style and they've the storybook motif which is just as clever in the first film as it is here and it's just i love it you, it's you, such a delight what, one thing that just popped into my head there i don't know why but every time they use the type or even just focus on it for a while while they're saying a line from the movie or telling the story or transitioning to the next part of the story i don't know what type of font they use but just it just looks so pleasing on the eye the way mm. they present it like crisp white background and that bold font yeah and the way that the words pop out when the narrator says them and the way Pooh interacts with them and like the little gags they do where like Pooh is running along and the word runs out and he mm. falls over and Pooh's like i wish that paragraph was longer <laughs> and when they get out of the hole the narration is the ladder that they climb up yeah and, and it spells the words it's like it's so clever it's such a fun idea so well implemented and it was in the first film as well obviously yeah it's just such a cool idea i love it much like the original poo film winnie the pooh is based on the eponymous novel by a a milne with illustrations by e h shepherd you have a poo map there on your shelf Gareth. yes you got me a poo map of the hundred acre wood for christmas that's famously by e h shepherd let me get it yeah. <laughs> 
that's the kind of ASMR that the listeners are looking for. Oh yeah, that's me picking things up. There's rabbits, friends, and and relations. Relations spelled or a l e t i o n s. The inability to spell or pronounce words uh, is a key feature of poo. I'm gonna get the poo book out again. <laughs> All the poo memorabilia. <laughs> Ken's gonna edit some of that out, I'd imagine. We'll we'll tidy it up in post. But yeah, so we have the the map of the poo world with all the poo characters and all their houses, so you know now where everything is relative. It's, it's because it's important to establish a sense of space, Ken. I'm sure we'll tweet these out in the Magic by Design. What's the Magic by Design Twitter handle? Ash Magic uh, Design Pod. No, Magic by Design. No, I don't know. But check the description. Ken will read it in the script in like 25 minutes, and yeah. that's how you'll know where to go for. It. Right, well, we've had pictures of that, uh, of that, so you can establish the sense of space. A uh, sense of space. It misspelled acre, which uh, I suppose. Oh well. It's supposed to be doing like that here. I know it's funny. <laughs> right. Yes, Ken got me Christmas presents. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome. Which I nearly dropped. <laughs> You mentioned the narrator guard. That's John Cleese. It is. And I didn't spot that until um, I saw it on the Wikipedia page, which means I didn't spot it at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised you didn't. He has a very distinctive he voice. He does. And I was like, oh, yeah, I would have thought that was him. Um, it's just a generic British man. But no, it's a very famous British man. Yeah, it's a very famous British man. And it's, it's perfect for this movie as well. I just like... Being from Python, he has that sense of earnestness. Python? Monty Python. There you go. Sorry. But you said it the American way, though. Sorry. Python. Python. You're Hulk Hogan. My 24-inch Monty Pythons, brother. Yeah, but being from Monty Python, he has the ability to be earnest, but also silly at the same time. Yeah. And he, he's the straight man until... And I like the way Pooh interacts with the narrator. It's like, and Pooh found the, the, the letter next to the door. It's like... I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then he takes ages to find it, and John Cleese is trying to direct him to the, and the note. Pooh is delightfully stupid in this film. Actually, no, <laughs> all the characters are delightfully stupid in this film. That's something that they hinted in the first film, but they really hit that home here. That And the thing is, the reason that they're stupid is they're all children. They're yes. all facsimiles of aspects of the ima- yeah, imagination aspects of his imagination and his psyche so they're all just utter morons and like all of the narrative of this film is pushed forward by all of these characters being stupid at one stage they're stuck in a hole and owl flies out to give piglet who goes to get help a pep talk and he flies back into the hole and they're like owl <laughs> and like and you think they're going to give out to owl but they're like that was a great speech yeah <laughs> Or the entire segment of Piglet trying to get them out and Piglet gets a rope. They're like, very good, Piglet, you need to get the six of us out. Then Piglet cuts the rope into six (laughs) parts. Or the fact that they end up in the hole in the first place because they they lay a trap for the, um, gone... gone, The Baxen. Baxen. I was like, gone soon? No, it's back soon. Baxen. They lay a trap for the Baxen and Pooh falls for their own trap and then they fall in the hole. Because he is desperate for honey. He's jonesing. Oh, Pooh is, uh, I think we mentioned in the first episode that Pooh is an addict. Pooh is even more of an addict in this movie. <laughs> he will do anything to get a, a smack roll. Yeah, like he shows up to Al's house toward the end of the film. It's like, just a little bit, just a little taste. A little taste. <laughs> just a tiny bit, tiny bit. But in fairness to him, when he finds Eeyore's tail, he does turn down the honey to reunite Eeyore with his tail. Knowing he'd be rewarded with more honey, though. So Pooh is A really giant pot of honey. The greedy choke. But yes, I, I delight in how stupid the characters are in this film. They're just utter morons in a way that's so funny. But they're never derided. I think it's just... They're just dumb. Yeah. <laughs> they're just idiots. Well, actually, well, and to be fair, who knows how dumb he is? Yeah, but they're all well-meaning and they're supportive of each other in their dumbness. Yeah, <laughs> and Pooh's like, I'm a bear with a very little brain. Or it's like, well, he's trying to read Owl's, or do, 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 write down Owl's words. And he's like, I don't like long words. <laughs> long words bother me. <laughs> long <laughs> words bother me, yes, that's the quote. <laughs> After seeing all the feature films about Winnie the Pooh, Bernie Mattinson thought he could use Millen's story in which Eeyore loses his tail and Pooh finds one as the basic idea for the plot. Mattinson's five minute pitch for the sequence where Eeyore loses his tail is credited with convincing Disney executives to make this film a feature length work that's a bit generous instead of a featurette. Originally the film was supposed to feature five stories as we said and they cut it down to three. I think the film at scarcely over an hour long. I, I imagine as we said if you're a parent you might have felt a bit cheated by that. But watching it at Disney Plus, I'm perfectly okay with it. Yeah, get over it, parents. Judge these films on quality, not quantity. And this film has plenty of quality. Especially if you're like getting someone else to bring the kids. You're like, I'm free for at least three hours. Like, you're back already. <laughs> God 70, damn it. 75 minutes later, they've <laughs> returned. It's like, what the hell? But like, the, all these films used to be 70 minutes long. So yeah. really, it's a throwback to old yeah. school Disney by making this film short. Yeah. Though I, I, I don't think it's the shortest of these films. I think some of the package films are like 45 and 50. Jumbo is quite short. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I don't think it's quite the shortest that we've watched in this run in this podcast history. Dumbo's like forty two minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, Dumbo's very short, and I think some of the package films are quite short as well. I remember delighting in how short the package films were, just <laughs> so they were over quite quickly. Uh, Dumbo sixty four, so Dumbo's yeah. actually longer than it. Oh yeah, that was actually maybe our review of it because we were not too enamored with that film. Yeah, Dumbo is fine. It's a perfectly fine film. But I'm on board with this because as a storybook film, short and sweet makes sense. Mm. And it's just, this film doesn't need to be longer. That's my thing. If you watch this film and you're like, I really needed that to be longer. And I love this. And I want all the poo in the world. Uh, Saludos Amigos is 42. So it's definitely not the shortest film. I, I don't get it. I really don't get why people would want this film to be longer. Because it would outstay its welcome. Owl is hilariously sanctimonious and clueless. He just makes stuff up as he goes along rather than admit that he doesn't know something. Owl is like the classic intellectual. The person who is he thinks he's cultured and smarter than everybody. And he knows everything. So he he refuses to accept that there are things that he does not know and then makes up or assumes everything that he does not know. It's a metaphor for society these days, Ken. Yeah. When you see these people acting as intellectuals on Twitter and whatnot that they, they simply cannot accept. And usually it's the intellectual work yourself into a shoot where it's like, I see the true narrative here because I'm the only one who is truly thinking and the rest of you are sheep. And that it just ends up that person being wrong. And Owl is clearly a satire of that kind of character. Yeah, just, you know, admit you're wrong. We don't know everything. Admit you're just stupid. Like, everybody in the world want, doesn't want to think they're stupid because, like, there's this weird fear that you'll be exposed and there's the whole imposter syndrome stuff, which is entirely real. And most of the time I'm have it. We don't know lots of things. I am an expert in practically nothing. The only thing I would say I am an expert in is the history of TNA wrestling, which is the most useless thing to be an expert well, in. Well, it's very useful to you, Gary, because you got a job out of it. Yes, it's my, my actual career. But other than that, I am not an expert in literally anything. I'm not an expert in Disney movies. There's people that know more about these movies than I ever will. I'm not an expert in video games. I'm not an expert in anything actually useful and practical like science or medicine. And I'm not going to ever assume that I am. I will always defer to people's expertise in those fields instead. Instead of convincing myself, I've done some reading and I, I you know, the intellectual approach, quote unquote. I'm stupid. I've accepted that. There's plenty of things I don't know. I've accepted that. And Al is obviously the kind of character who has not. Played very well by Craig Ferguson. I think he's a bit too much. Well, I think I think, but like, you know, he's well known as a chat show host, so he wouldn't do too many film roles. So I think he was just laying it on a bit thick. But yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, th- I thought his performance was just, just, just. Uh, maybe there was too much of Owl as opposed to too much of Craig Ferguson. But yeah. like, Craig Ferguson also played a role in How to Train Your Dragon King in those films. He's better than that. He yeah. played. Was it Gobbler? Is that the name of that character? I think so. So there you go. He's a veteran of animated movies. Yeah, he just takes the paycheck and shows up in the booth and shouts for a while. In a British accent, even though he's Scottish. Pooh's puzzled face from this movie has become quite the popular meme. <laughs> Pooh is so stupid and confused all the time. And he's like, how can I get honey? <laughs> and he does that face, and that face is a meme. You, you know it, you've seen it. I also think the Baxin sequence is great. Baxin, the Baxin. I really love the chalkboard style. It seems like even the Hundred Acre Wood is not free of conspiracy theories, and maybe even imaginary play friends need a big bad to blame all their problems on. Well, yeah, that's always the poo thing, though, isn't it? The, the heffalumps and the the, the the feasels? Weasels? Woozles. Woozles, there we go. All of those are fake. All of those are just these imaginary villains that, that they've whipped up in their head, and, and usually out of, like, misinformation or misreading a letter. And the, actually, the best part of it is when uh, the, when they're singing the Baxin song, and it's like, and we'll be back soon after we take down the Baxin, whatever the lyric is. And Owl is, back soon. That sounds like Baxin. Ah, there's probably nothing there. <laughs> and then they all turn in when they realise that he got it wrong at the end. But overall, I think this film is just as odd, meta and joke dense as the original. And I'm, I'm really here for that. It's so funny. This film is just, there's so many like one-liners and dumb expressions. And as I said, the plot is entirely propelled by stupidity, which is the best. So you don't ever have to be like, hmm, does the, do the plot dynamics of this film work? Oh, you know, it's like, Pooh is stupid. And that propels the next thing that happens in the film. And then Piglet is a coward. And that propels the next next thing about the film and then tigger is an uber narcissist and that propels the next thing about the film and, and like tigger for once thank god we have tigger as the villain of the film again more or less because technically tigger is the baxon until it's revealed post credits that the baxon is actually real <laughs> i don't know I, I would have said owl is technically the villain because he leads them astray 
But then Tigger is playing the role of the Baxon, though. So, bad guy. You just don't like Tigger. I don't like Tigger. Tigger sucks. He's the worst Pooh character. Girl, we touched on the music a little bit. The Lopez's really captured the spirit of the Sherman Brothers style. They did the original film, as we know. Like, they're, they're short songs. They're not very long, but they're toe tappers and they're quite memorable. The Honey song in particular reminds me of the Lopez style because it sounds quite a lot like Olaf's summer song from Frozen. Yeah, in the summer. It's a, it has a, a, the same vibe. I do like yeah. the, the opening song when Pooh is going to look for honey and his yeah. stomach is growling and rumbling in, like, harmonizing with the music. Ah, yes, the tummy song. The tummy, the the stomach is performing. I quite like that. And uh, yeah, all the songs are are, are witty and delightful and and very quick and pithy. And they're they're not the songs I think you'll like super remember except maybe the backs and the backs and that'll be stuck in your head for a while. But for the most part, they're just like a really quick, delightful song. And I love the little song they sing whenever somebody wins. And it's like, they're they're, they're getting the honey. And it's like, no. Enjoy. (laughs) And it's like, nope, uh, Pooh didn't get it. And And then Kanga wins and Kanga's like, don't sing the song <laughs> Kanga who was voiced by Kristen Anderson Lopez yeah there you go yeah I like the music in the film a lot it's like not it's it's not the, as I said it's not the super hard hitting swinging for the fences soundtrack in the same way Tangled is but it's it's light and delightful in the same way that everything about this film is and thus perfectly matches the film bouncy and bright and brief which we like Zoe Deschanel performed three songs in the movie including a take on the Winnie the Pooh theme song a very important thing to do and the original end credit song So Long what, what do you make of her take on the classic Pooh song and the original songs in this movie I thought it was quite nice she has a pretty voice and it's almost kind of playful and childlike who's that girl it's Jess it's Zoe Deschanel it's Pooh <laughs> yeah. Again, I don't think you'll be singing these songs afterwards, but they do add up to the sum of the parts of a great movie. Yeah. And that's really the story of all of this. Like, nothing about this film is exceptional, but everything about this film combines to form something exceptional. Like, the animation, there's better animation, you'll see better animation in different films. But the animation is perfect for what this film is trying to be. The music, there's better music in the world, but this, the music is perfect for what this film is trying to be. You'll find better story, you'll find better jokes in films, but these stories and these jokes are perfect for what Winnie the Pooh tries to be. So it's like, this is just a great poo film they didn't try and do something else they didn't try and reinvent the wheel they didn't go post-apocalyptic they didn't do any of the stuff you could do they just made a great poo film but you know i think that this film is smart and it doesn't talk down to kids or treat them like dopes and there could have been a temptation as i said make this in 3d make it an hour and a half long make poo a sassy wisecracker you know completely betray everything that makes poo great but they stuck to the playbook that was successful with the first film and i think that it came through Uh, it's a nice hit of nostalgia while updating a classic tale yeah and we did mention the live action intro which i i adore i love it so much because yeah. like they go they pan through this bedroom where all the like the the teddy bear characters are and they they revisit for the start of the credits where they show a bunch of like scenes from the movie being reenacted by the teddy bears and it's just so delightful and it, like it, that room is fully detailed in a way that like it's it's it feels like a more full set than you'd see in most actual live action films I, i'd love to see the prop department like go through and like oh we need these kind of books here to really add this character character and these toys and this this is the kind of setting and furniture that really works to uh, uh, to amplify the poo characters and the period of time in which christopher robin is supposed to have been a boy it's just such a delightful way to both open and close the film yeah and since the film you know it ends at around 51 52 minutes we're we're deep into the credits by the time we noticed the 55 minute time and i think it was nearly at the end of the credits at that point but the credits are worth watching by themselves so i view them as part of the film yeah they're they're uh, and there's a post credit scene so yeah. Yes. Watch all the way, even though we skipped the most credits, we didn't yeah. actually watch all of the credits. That's the but, beauty of Disney Plus. Yeah, I I like this film a lot. Eeyore is a delight in this film. Like, there's I think when he was given the um the cuckoo clock tail, he's like, nice tail, much better than the rest of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's such a wonderfully depressed character. The kind of character you just like, he would be like focus tested out of other like children's films. Oh, yeah. you can, you can't have a character that like openly depressed. He's too negative in a children's film. Whereas like no, because like that's the character they leave him in there and they leave him just as openly depressed and miserable and, and utterly relatable as a result and, and so I think that's like an important thing to represent in like children and usually the way like sadness is represented in children's films is like this a parent dies yeah usually like <laughs> I was about to say it's like this big thing happens and the person is sad and they have to overcome the sadness which you know there is sadness in life that you should have to overcome and move on from but there's sadness in life 
that you have to live with and yeah. live with forever and carry with and try not to give into, but it's always there and la- hanging and lingering over you. And that's what Eeyore is a, is a character. It's one thing like I noticed that people always assume kids will bounce back. You know, we're all in our own heads, but I'm an adult. I have worries, you know, and I have things I'm going through. The pandemic being a primary example. We're like, ah, who, who cares? They're not in school. Like, and you know, to a kid not being in school, that's a big deal in their world. They have worries. They fret about these things. So, you know, if you want to get really meta about it, as we said, all the toys represent a facet of Christopher Robin's personality and his psyche. And, you know, kids get depressed in their own world. They have worries that bother them and drag them down. And it's important to represent those in a way that's not just, my mom died and I feel sad. It's just like, the world has made me feel sad. That's what Eeyore is. We got that's you, great. We got you a talking puppy and you're happy now. Yeah, like, that's usually what the, how children around, or uh, how sadness is expressed through children. Or through not even children. It's just like, in, in most films, that's how sadness is expressed. Bad thing happens, I feel sad. Instead of like, I just feel sad sometimes. Yeah, and bad thing happened a long time ago and it still makes me sad sometimes. Yeah, and uh, also, there's a, a period toward, toward the end of the film where Pooh is looking sternly at Eeyore's tail while hung to a doorbell yeah. and he's desperately trying to work something out yeah. and, and you know, Owl is always distracting him by, by inviting him to read the book and whatnot and Pooh is just staring at it intently <laughs> and it made me desperately want a Winnie the Pooh Sherlock Holmes adaptation <laughs> where Pooh is just like stupid and has you know Holmes is always like oh I have, I have this huge intellect and I've deduced all these things and then Pooh is just the opposite where he stumbles his way through these things doesn't understand anything thing and obviously somehow solves the crime in the end see you'd have piglet as watson yes. who actually says everything that's correct and he gets immediately discounted because he's so meek yeah so god so we need post-apocalyptic poo and we need sherlock holmes sherlock poo that's what this is what we i want out of the out of like the next step for winnie the poo or you do a, a rescue or not rescuers a great mouse detective poo crossover how good Ooh, would that be like he solves the crime in the hundred acre wood yeah they're both in england Ah, oh, that's and probably during roughly the same time period. It writes itself, Gar. As of 2021, Gar, we're going to the legacy now. This is Disney's most recent traditionally animated theatrical film. We, we've referenced we've referenced this in recent weeks. We haven't seen one since. It's, it's a shame. It's the death of 2D. It's the, and I don't think they have 2D projects on the books, do they? No, I think, as we said in recent weeks, there is an option to use it if the creative team thinks it's the right choice, but... Th- I don't think that's the case. I think they're actively discouraged. Yeah. Like, as I said, After Princess and the Frog like it was a modest success, but not a huge success, and Tangled made more money. And after Pooh didn't make any money, it's just they probably like, all right, 2D is done. We tried. Which, to be fair, they did. And they still use it in TV and stuff, so it's not lost. Yeah, and I do wonder, is like, is it just like 2D uh, people, audiences just don't want 2D animation anymore? Maybe it is that. Maybe it is that simple. I think a generation has grown up with 3D. So that's, mm. that is animation to them. They consider that normal. So maybe, I don't know, there's a lot of factors that go in there as well, like, you know. Yeah, cost is the bigger one, I'd say, these days yeah. as well, just because 3D is probably cheaper than 2D now, so and they're always wanting to push these technologies and move them forward we've seen in all these disney movies they normally advance in some way to try and pull off a shot or a technique that they want so maybe they just see it as too primitive and they want to be seen as a forward-thinking modern company that's pushing the art form yeah and especially i suppose these days as you mentioned as technology does move forward there is nothing they can't do in 3d anymore you know at least in the mid to early 2000s they'd be like uh we could try doing that in 3d animation it probably looked pretty bad though have you seen dinosaur <laughs> Whereas now it's like, yeah, we can do whatever we want. True. This is the first collaboration between Disney and the Lopez's, a partnership which would, of course, give us Frozen Mm -hmm. in a few films. Which would torment parents for appearances, parents forever. Yeah, and they are the Sherman brothers of the modern age. Mm -hmm. We also haven't seen any significant use of the Pooh character since, as we said, not even in a kid's show. Has there not been a kid's show since this? There surely has. Save for the live action adaptation Christopher Robin, which was released in 2018. Which I love. Um, so there's, yeah, there was the My Tigger and Pooh friends that came before this. Yeah, I suppose there hasn't been. Gar- I did some research, okay? All right, all right. What's the what's this Doc McStuffins stuff? Doc McStuffins is a doctor who fixes toys. Oh, so there's probably her- some Pooh crossover there. Yeah. That's the reason it's listed on the Wikipedia page. So yeah, Disney is mothballed Pooh. It's very upsetting. Yeah, in fairness, 
Poo. Well, actually, no, they make Christopher Robin, but yeah. still. And Pooh is ubiquitous in theme parks. Yes, his theme park rides. He has the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and Pooh's Honey, honey Hunt in theme parks. And, you know, the merchandise is still very popular. He's still, he was in Kingdom Hearts 3, which is all that matters. He visited the 100 Acre Wood, he did some rhythm games, he shot some turnips. But, like, I reckon you could make a pretty nice Pooh series in the style of this film for Disney+. Plus. Yeah, or at least, like, a series of, like, 10-minute shorts. You could do some fun stuff. Like, don't you, don't you, it's Pooh and the Muppets are the two things that Disney obviously should no longer own, because they cannot be trusted with. To sum up, Gar, in comparison to the, the 1977 film, it's it's hard really because I think it's a continuation mm. and it takes a lot of the elements that are great about that film and dates them for the modern day. I, I don't think I prefer one over the other. I think both are great. Yeah, both are just exceptionally enjoyable films that will just bring... And they're like, they're not difficult to watch. They're not about anything. They're just like these delightful characters in silly dumb stories that don't have stakes they don't have anything they're just there to make jokes and make you feel good and that's what both of these films are and they both succeed like brilliantly at doing so and I love it and like you have the deep stuff like Eeyore we talked about there's death in these films of course <laughs> that's why I can watch it as a 32 year old <laughs> justified uh, giving a 45 minute deep critical analysis of it <laughs> but uh, seriously though these films uh, especially this one and even the last one they're both just, just they're just perfect they're, they're Winnie the Pooh encapsulated in a way that should make any person feel joy. And that's all you could possibly ask for from a film like this. Sadly, dear listeners, much like Pooh and Christopher Robin, we've nearly come to the end of our time together this week. Resident musical expert Nicole is coming up in just a few moments with a tune from Winnie the Pooh. I promise you that it will be as sweet as honey, so be sure to stay tuned for that at the end of the show. Honey is in your dog or honey is in real honey? Real honey. Oh, thank God. My dog's not that sweet sometimes. No, she's the worst. And she's also having poo problems today. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's not bring that into the podcast. <laughs> I like to hear like, oh, don't you, don't you, honey will feel bad about it. <laughs> These kind of she listens things. every week. <laughs> She'll get upset, but is it poo? Because poo. Also, watch Christopher Robin as well, by the way. That film is great. Yeah, also available on Disney+. Plus. New episodes of Magic by Design land every Monday, where all magical podcasts are downloaded. Stop by the website at magicbydesign.buzzsprout.com to find a full list of podcast platforms. We are literally everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, you name it, we're on it, including YouTube. Garrett's nearly caught up now. Make sure to subscribe wherever your heart desires so you never miss an episode. Do you love this version of Winnie the Pooh or are you a stan for the original 1977 version? Let us know by joining the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash magic by design pod, on Twitter at magic design pod, and on Insta at magic by design pod. I should have known that earlier. Yeah, when we mentioned it earlier, that's, that's where you go, where we'll tweet pictures of the stuff. Pooh. No, oh, Pooh, thank you for joining us, by the way. Our guest star, Winnie the Pooh, he was here. Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Poop who is delighted if you're a fan of the show and want to support what we're doing here please do consider giving us a review on your podcast platform of choice share the podcast on your socials or even recommend the show to a fellow Disney fan five stars please five honey pots of poo poo doesn't, poo doesn't want anything less or else he'll be sad and you don't want to make poo sad do you watch this film and anytime, every time poo is sad he makes a sad face and you don't want to see that if you don't give us a five star review, we'll also stick the backson on you. The backson, the backson. He'll poke hole in your sock. He'll. Uh, they should have. One of the ones they obviously should have added was he'll tangle your earphones. I think that's a backson thing. Yeah. He'll make you wake up in the middle of the night with no clothes on. Yeah. That's. Does that happen to you a lot? No, but people like say that sometimes. Like, oh, I woke, I woke up and the cover was on the floor and I wasn't wearing my pajamas anymore. It's like, how did that happen? I've never heard someone say that in my life. Well, it was the Baxton guy. The Baxton. The Baxton. The Baxton sabotages your podcast audio. Anytime you don't record, or anytime you realize you haven't recorded the podcast after you've finished doing the recording of the podcast, Baxton. Of course. Next week, we celebrate the one year anniversary of Magic by Design with a review of Disney's 52nd animated feature, Wreck It Ralph. So be sure to join us for that. But until then, stay safe and remember where possible, always use simple words because most of us are bears of very little brain and long words bother us. <laughs> God, I love to. <laughs> Now then, it's time again for our favourite part of the week. Nicole has come to play with a rendition of So Long from Winnie the Pooh. Thanks for listening. Now, take us home, Nicole. Hello there, my Disney lovers. It's me, your musical correspondent, Nicole, coming to you live from my bedroom. This week, we're revisiting the Hundred Acre Wood and Winnie the Pooh. Directors Stephen Anderson and Don Hall were eager to find the right songwriters to contribute to the movie, and so approached five songwriting teams. The successful duo were Robert Lopez and Kirsten Anderson Lopez. 
The winning song that got them the gig was their version of Everything is Honey, a song where Pooh experiences hallucinations while desperately hungry for honey. Their inspiration came from their lack of sleep after having their newborn, Annie. The duo wrote seven songs in total, including The Tummy Song, A Very Important Thing to Do, Everything is Honey, The Winner Song, The Baxin Song, Pooh's Finale and It's Gonna Be Great. Zoe Deschanel performs three songs in the movie, including a version of the Winnie the Pooh theme, Everything is Honey and So Long, a song written by Deschanel with she and him bandmate Matthew Ward, which plays during the credits. The film was scored by British composer Henry Jackman, who scored music for DreamWorks Animation's Monsters vs. Aliens and Puss in Boots, as well as X-Men First Class. Jackman was supported by fellow Brit Christopher Willis, who composed additional music for the movie. The song So Long by She and Him was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Song Written for Visual Media. Here's my version. Before you enjoy it, I must add a disclaimer that I may have removed the vocals from the original track as I couldn't find a backing track anywhere, so you might hear a little bit of Zoe. So go ahead and enjoy it. It's not complicated, but very hard to grasp. But every time I see you, I laugh I won't get too sappy, I've had no epiphany I just enjoy your company You test my nerves, it makes me stronger So can you bother me a little bit longer? Hate to say goodbye, goodbye Hate to say the end, the end Cause it's been so long since I've made a friend Hate to say goodbye, goodbye Hate to say the end, the end Cause it's been so long since i made a friend like you Well, I could dot the eye and you could cross the T's Cause letters alone are lonely Well I could be the blossom And you could be the bee And then I could call you honey You test my nerves, it makes me stronger So can you bother me a little bit longer? Hate to say goodbye, goodbye Hate to say the end, the end Cause it's been so long since I made a friend Hate to say goodbye, goodbye Hate to say the end, the end Cause it's been so long since I made a friend like you Some like to be alone, independent and on their own, all alone. I guess they're free, but not me, not me. Hate to say goodbye, goodbye. Hate to say the end, the end, cause it's been so long since I made a friend. Hate to say goodbye, goodbye. Hate to say the end, the end. Cause it's been so long since I made a friend like you. Hate to say goodbye, goodbye. Hate to say the end, the end. Cause it's been so long since I made a friend like you. Yes, it's been so long since I made a friend like you. Yes, it's been so long.